Okay. So we got a big, big piece of skin here. See the area I want to show you first. Ah, there. What's happening to the epidermis here? Here's the normal epidermis, normal ish. And then here's the epidermis in the middle. Death. Very good. Someone said the epidermis is death. It's dying, right? It's not totally dead yet. It's not quite dead yet if you're a Monty Python fan, but, but they, it's on its way out, right? The nuclei are still got, they've got some purple in there but they're starting to wither and kind of wilt away. And you can see that they're getting pale and washing out. Because remember, as cells die, the nuclei, the, the membranes around the cell and around the nucleus break down. And our body is really good at breaking down nucleic acids. We have lots of uh, nucleases floating around in our body because we don't want free floating DNA and RNA just running amok in our system. So the nucleic acids in the nucleus get broken down right away. The proteins in the cytoplasm, they're like big, you know, big filaments. They're like, you know, like um, steel cables basically holding the cells together. They take a lot longer time for the, the body to break down and remove. So that's why when things die, the nucleic acids go away and that's what is stains with the hematoxyl and the purple stuff that we see is DNA basically. And the pink stuff that we see are proteins. Proteins stain with eosin. So when you have necrosis, only the proteins are left and that's why necrosis looks pink. So the epidermis is undergoing um, necrosis. And yes, you guys, some of you were, were really quick and already saw what's causing the necrosis of the epidermis here. And it's because there is all sorts of fungus down in the dermis. You can see the hyphae here, look at those. These are the hyphae growing everywhere in the tissue. You don't even need any special stains to see this. It's very obvious um, on H&E. And in this case, the fungus is actually overrunning the, um, the uh, epidermis too. And I've seen that before, and this patient was of course severely immune suppressed. And in severely immune suppressed, I've seen fungal um, hyphae that normally are dermal like from angioinvasive fungus, grow up through uh, the, uh, the epidermis because there's just nothing there to stop them. So as the epidermis dies, they just grow on up through it as well. See, there's like a, a hypha right there growing its way up into the, the uh, epidermis. But the reason the epidermis is dying here is because there's blockage of blood flow, okay? So there's ischemia that's because that's a sign to me that there's probably angioinvasive fungus somewhere down below. And in fact, this is probably like, I think this may have been a vessel right here that's totally replaced. That may have been too. It probably used to be a vessel and it's completely filled with fungus now that are growing through the vessel, out of the wall and into the dermis. Here's a vessel here, you can see it more clearly. There's fungal hyphae everywhere in this vessel. And if we go down, usually the, the vessels that are, are gonna be the most impacted are these big deep ones and those are the ones that cause the ischemic change. And there, that's a perfect example. This is an entire blood vessel dilated, filled with fungal hyphae and in between, we probably have a bit of antigen antibody complex, splendor Hopley phenomenon, as well as fibrin. And it's just clotting up the whole vessel with fungus. And then that fungus grows out. And so this is how angioinvasive fungus works. You might have a nidus of fungus somewhere in the, the nasopharynx or the lung. And then it gets into the blood vessels in those sites and spreads, kind of almost metastasizes to um, other parts of the body. And then once it lodges in the vessel there in the skin, it comes out and grows. And then it kills the skin. And what you get is an area of purple, black um, death of the skin with hemorrhage, and then it forms an eschar. And I, obviously when you see that kind of a finding in someone who's immune suppressed, angioinvasive fungus should be the top thing on the differential diagnosis. This is, I've seen quite a bit of angioinvasive fungus um, in, in my practice. This is probably the most dramatic case that I think that I've ever seen. You can see here, here's a muscular vessel, a larger vessel. It's like every single vessel is overrun. So this is another one of those times where you say, well, what kind of fungus might it be if you had to guess? Well, some of these look awfully ribbon-like to me, um, like they would belong to the, the um, zygomycosis group, which includes mucor, mycosis, absidia, rhizopus, and some others, okay? And then other ones up towards the top look more like they were septated. And in fact, this actually cultured out, if I recall, both aspergillus and rhizopus. So it was a mixed infection of both, uh, both the zygomycotic group of the ribbon-like fungi and also the septated fungi like aspergillus. So this ended up growing, growing both. But really, really dramatic example. And you can see that in addition to having epidermal necrosis up here, there's also like an unusual pattern of fat necrosis where you're getting like this kind of crystallization, um, which is really, really strange and unusual. I don't feel like we often see that pattern of fat necrosis 
um, in, um, in association with angioinvasive fungus. So I thought it was a really, really fascinating case. There's more fungal hyphae right here, and there, and there. They're just everywhere. And I think one more thing I'll point out over to the side here. Let me turn it. is here is like a full-blown ulcer that's completely died. So this is an infarct, okay? So the idea is that the fungus blocks up the vessel here, and then in this wedge shape over top of it, everything dies. And this will happen with angioinvasive fungus, but it will happen with any vaso-occlusive process that's severe enough. So that's why when we see complete death that's a wedge shape like this, which is an advanced lesion that's a full-blown infarct, or even when I just start to see ischemic change where the epidermis is looking kind of ratty and dead, like it's dying, I want right away to figure out what is blocking the blood flow. Whether it's angioinvasive fungus or it's thrombus because they've got uh, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy or it's blockage because of calcic phylaxis or something else. But to me, when I see ischemic change in the epidermis, the next step is figuring out why is it there? What's the cause? And we don't stop until we find the cause because many of the things that cause this are medical emergencies. So um, recognizing ischemic change is an incredibly important skill um, in dermatopathology because it doesn't necessarily look real impressive at first, but when I see this, it, man, that sends up all the worries for me um, uh, to, to make sure that we're not missing uh, something terrible. And I think there was one other place um, I lied. I said there was nothing else I was going to show you, but I guess I should have marked it on the slide. Before the epidermis um, dies, what, what dies first? What's the first thing to die when you have ischemia? What structure? I'm trying to find a good example. That'll work is the eccrine coils, right? So here the eccrine coils aren't totally dead, but they do not look happy, right? So the first thing is if I'm, if I'm thinking of ischemia, I go and look for eccrine coils and see, are they starting to get degenerated or totally necrotic? Because that's usually the first sign that you're going to see um, when, there's, uh, when there's ischemia. And that's a good, a good uh, clue for ischemic change. Like there, that probably, it's hard to tell because there's fungus around in vessels, but there's an eccrine duct right here and it's looking like withering away and dying. All right. Here's another example of angioinvasive fungus, and this one is like from the center of, of an eschar, okay? And the top is just completely dead. It's absolute solid mass of coagulative necrosis, and it's completely overrun by fungi. So here's fungi here, probably growing in a pre-existing vessel, growing out all the way through the dead dermis. You can tell it's dermis. Look, there's elastic fibers there, see? The fibers are still left, because they're proteins also. And then the fungus is growing all the way uh, to the surface. I can't remember what species this was, but let's go down here in the bottom, and there it is. See the big thick vessel? And that's where the fungus is from. Fungus and fibrin thrombus blocking the vessel. Everything above it died, and then the fungus grows out. And you know how I just told you that we don't usually see this crystal pattern in fat necrosis? Maybe I've just not been paying enough attention, because here it is in another case. So interesting. Or maybe I just decided to scan them or recut them because I like the crystals and then I just forgot. I don't know which. But this was from a different patient, if I recall. So um, this is, a, this is a, a just dramatic example from the middle of an SR. And I think that actually raises a good question of when you have someone with an SR and you're worried about a vaso-occlusive process, where do you biopsy from? Um, you know, sometimes we teach with big ulcers to biopsy from the edge, like if you're thinking about pyoderma gangrenosum, getting a, a big punch or I, ideally an ellipse or a wedge biopsy it, that, that span the, the border of the lesion can be really helpful, particularly in ulcers, like when you're worried about pyoderma gangrenosum. But when you're worried about vaso-occlusive process, uh, angioinvasive fungus, calciphylaxis, I feel like oftentimes getting a punch in the middle of the lesion can actually help us more there because that's where we're more likely to see at the bottom of the middle the vessels that are impacted the most. If you're able to get a double punch, so punching once, uh, for those at home who have not seen this, it's a telescoping punch or a double punch, can be challenging to do, but sometimes if it's not, if, if you don't have a, a feasible way to get an elliptical biopsy down into the fat, it's a way to allow you to get deep sampling with just a punch tool. You can punch and remove the skin, take that plug out, and then go into that same hole and punch down deeper. Um, although from some of my derm residents, they've told me that it's really challenging to do because it often bleeds a lot into the hole, and then, um, and then you have to punch deeper. So I realize that it may be problematic, 
but um, in the in the kind of time where you have an SR and you're worried about vaso occlusion, the deeper down into the fat you get, the more likely we are as dermatopathologists to be able to find the blocked vessel. These cases I'm showing you here are exuberant and dramatic and it's no problem, but a lot of times we just will see necrosis and we won't be able to see definitive thrombi or calcium. So getting down into the fat, that's where the money often is. So if you can get a deep uh, punch down into the fat, that's potentially gonna be the most useful um, to us. So when, the, when you're thinking about vessel occlusion, I, that's what I personally like. Um, okay.